Uh, kia ora tato, no mai, hari mai. Welcome to our council meeting of Wednesday, 23rd of September, 2020. Uh, to councillor staff and and staff uh, in the gallery and any public that may enter a little bit later. Uh, just explain that this meeting has been recorded and it'll be on the council's website. We've now discovered where that actually is on the website, which is great. Um, and just to go through the health and safety uh, for this uh, facility, uh, our toilets are in the uh, entrance area that you came through. Male and female toilets are located there. Uh, this centre is a, obviously a non-smoking facility, so um, if you wish to smoke, please encourage to do that uh, outside and five metres away from the doors. Uh, a first aid kit and a defibrillator uh, are located in the main office. Uh, in the Unlike the event of an emergency, um, please exit through your nearest marked exit door and the assembly points are on both sides in the, in the car park areas and a staff member there will um, assist in that process. So councillors, uh, welcome again. Um, we'll go through our order of business. Uh, number one being apologies. I haven't received any and you all are present. That's fantastic. Uh, number two being notifications of additional items. Uh, I don't have any uh, or haven't been notified of any. So we'll move through to three being declarations of interest, uh, if there are any. And again, I haven't been notified. Nothing from the floor. Uh, we were due to have a deputation number four from James Baird, but James, are you here? No. We'll move on. Number five being uh, confirmation of our minutes of the ordinary meeting of the 26th of August 2020 part one public be confirmed as true and correct. I'll look to move those seconded by the deputy mayor. Are there any matters arising? There being none, I'll ask you to vote please. Okay, that's passed 16 votes for, none against, thank you. All right, um, we now move to number six, which is a, a notice of motion uh, around the representation review. It's on page 31 of your papers. And Councillor Bowen, I'll pass to you. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I did wonder if we might take the report um, the officer report questions first rather than duplicate that, but I'm happy to speak to it now if you'd rather. Um, okay, we'll do, we we'll, might do the officer report first. That's, um, that's a good choice. Um, I'll ask um, the officer concerned, uh, Hannah, Hannah White, our governance manager, just to briefly speak to that. And councillors, if, obviously, if you have any questions. I think uh, the report that is attached is pretty self-explanatory. I won't spend much time talking to it, but I'm happy to take any questions. Um, I, in, in quick summary, is a is a representation review necessary at this point? No. Um, are you able to do it? Yes, you are. Uh, are you, um, if you did, it would be an unbudgeted expense. It wasn't part of um, the LTP budgeting process, so. Um, or the outside of that. Uh, it would need to look at all the aspects that are listed in the Local Electoral Act in Section 19H, which are listed in the report. Uh, would there be value from doing it? Certainly. Um, there may be an opportunity to open that conversation around, obviously around our representation. Uh, we're all aware of our, our um, turnout for our voting rate. 
Uh, so that you know, there could be value from doing that. Uh, having uh, moving the option to this triennium uh, would allow the current elected members to contribute to how that review is framed uh, and and what which issues we test with the community. Uh, that's probably all. Thank you, Hannah. Um, I'll open it for questions. Um, Councillor Rutherford and then Councillor Fanai. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Hannah. Um, I've just got a question around the additional recommend or the officer's recommendation um, around the unbudgeted expense of up to $30,000. If we look at um, the timing of when, how long we would need for a review and when we would need it, report, it completed to be able to inform um, the following election, is it possible that that would actually could that happen in the second half of next year, which would then um, mean it could actually be included in the long-term plan for um, consultation and not require an unbudgeted expense? In short, it could, but it wouldn't look like a robust process. So you have between, legislatively, you have between March and September to go out with an initial proposal uh, and and then until December for people to put in the appeal so that it would fit within the timeframes for the next election. Um, good practice would look like going out with some pre-consultation prior to that initial proposal. Uh, so starting as soon as possible and then putting the initial proposal out closer to March rather than in July. But it's not impossible. You could put it out. You could do it. So, August, for example. Yeah, so just to be clear, you understood I was just referring to we wouldn't consult as a part of the long term plan. That would still be a no, separate no. process. That's right. But just the thirty thousand dollars could come out of next year's budget rather than an unbudgeted expense. Yes, it would be possible, but that pre work tight. would be pretty limited. If we, it would be very tight timeframes. Okay, thank you. So if I could, if I could add in, so you, you, you're talking about a two stage, the traditional two stage. Uh, but the Act does allow us to do just one consultation, not the two-stage consultation. You could go out with an initial proposal having not done that pre-consultation work. Uh, it's, it's not considered good practice by the Local Government Commission, which is where the appeals eventually fall. Mm. Yeah, but also confuses the public. Um, Councillor Finlay. Just want to uh, check on something. If, if this fails today, and enough members of the public get a petition up and ask for a binding referendum. Can that still happen if we say no today? So the, the ability to go out for a poll uh, is on the electoral system, which you made the decision on in March. So um, the members of the public can bring a, a petition to us up until February next year to talk about the electoral system, but not about the representation review. As I understand. Okay, they can't on the representation. Thank you. Councillor Bowen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, it might seem odd that I'm asking questions about my own notice of motion, but having put the notice in, I don't see, didn't see the officer's report until we all did. So, um, Hannah, I just wanted a couple of questions, probably the first following up um, what Councillor Rutherford and the Mayor were getting towards, I think. You talk about the best practice of pre consultation. I think we all accept that. But you said that we, we will be seen to have not done the pre-consultation work. And I suppose, is there is it possible that we could take a view that we have done pre-consultation on this because we've been asking the question so regularly over the last 10 years? Most recently in 2018, we asked the question. So the, the data in the report, which refers to the 2018 representation review, there wasn't any voice asking for the particular issue. Yep. Yeah, so I think you'd say that if we we're basing it on the 2018 review, there wouldn't be a need to do one. So are you saying that we should only progress this if there is a community voice that wants it? No, elected members have yep. that voice as well. Absolutely. Um, and who decides whether we do or what that pre-consultation work looks like, whether it takes a, an additional form now or whether we take forward the previous work, who makes that decision? Uh, officers would make that decision based on the direction you gave us today. We could give direction, okay. And, and I suppose my, my final question is kind of the big question. 
what, why do we have 16 elected members? So we've had 16 elected members in Palmas North City Council ever since the 1989 uh, changes to local government. Uh, those 16 members were uh, set according to the population in each of the wards. Uh, and there is a rule that's referred to in the report with the plus or minus 10% rule, which says that every particular area that's voting needs to be um, fairly represented. So you can't have more elected members per uh, per person voting in one ward and not in the other. So because of the number of wards we had, we then needed to have a fair number of, of councillors in each of those wards. When we removed the wards and went to at large, uh, the number of councillors remained the same. That uh, has been looked at every time there's been a representation review, but status quo has, has mm. been kept. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hancock. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. I've uh, just got a few questions. Um, I just, just for the purpose of clarity, um, so this notice of motion really just talks about um, the number of elected members. Um, so therefore, we are looking at um, an expenditure of thirty thousand dollars, which is at presently and budgeted. Is that correct? If we went out for a representation review. Through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, we would have to look at all of the issues, um, not just the number of councillors. So we need to look at wards, we need to look at community boards, all those things. So we have to make sure that we've considered everything. But the matter that we've actually got before us does not consider wards, Māori wards, community boards, or mixed ward, um, and uh, elected member op options, does it? So Māori wards, uh, have we can't discuss them this round um, because of the binding poll on that through into the following election. So that's separate to this review. Um, if um, the, the notice of motion that's come up from the councillor specifies that there would be a focus on the number of elected members, but we would also need to look at wards and community boards if we opened up a representation review. We can't choose to not look at those things. So, so at this point, we we appear to be cherry picking one part of what is a representation representation review, and we've actually excluded the Maori voice from that. No, we're not able to look at Maori wards because of what has happened in the in the previous rounds of representation review. So, what happens is a representation review specifically looks at wards community boards, number of councillors, whether that's at large or in wards. Um, before you look at a representation review, you must look at Māori wards, and before that, you must look at the electoral system. So we've done the electoral system, you remember, in March, and as I say, that's still open until February for any changes. Um, Māori wards we can't do because um, that was looked at in the previous training and a binding poll was made a decision on that. So it's not that we're excluding that, it's that we can't look at it. So, so, so therefore, we have to go through the same exercise in the next triennium and therefore incur further costs. Is that right? That's correct. We would, regardless of the decision today, we would be doing a representation review in the next triennium uh, and that would be a part of our long-term planning. So, so actually, in terms of, of this particular notice of motion, can you tell me what level of consultation has taken place with EWI in terms of gauging their views about this? I've spoken uh, to our Dangatane representatives on this issue. Um, they're pretty united in a voice that they don't see a need for it to happen until the next three years. So I suppose my last question really is, um, potentially, if uh, this uh, was, was agreed to today, uh, the first casualty might be diversity. I'm not sure that, um, Councillor, that uh, the officer needs to, um, that's a very leading question. Um, I don't think you need to answer that. Sorry, Councillor. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. That's uh, that's all my questions. Thank you. Um, Councillor Dingwell. Thank you, Mr Mayor, and thank you, Hannah, for this report. Um, my first question was actually answered by um, Councillor Hancock, so that's all right. Um, my second question is, 
based on page 35, um, number 2.3, where it talks about um, the representation review in 2018, we had the preliminary consultation, we got 30 submissions, 36.7 wanted fewer counsellors, then with the initial proposal we received 20 submissions, 17 supported the current number of counsellors, so I'm assuming three submitters didn't support or didn't care either way. And so of the small amount of people who actually wanted fewer counsellors, do we know what their reasons were for taking that position? I haven't looked at the detail of those submissions from 2018 in preparing this report. I would be looking at that if we were preparing an initial proposal going forward. Okay, cool, thank you. Uh, Councillor Naylor. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, just a couple of questions. Thanks, Hannah. Um, I'm just wanting to be clear about whether or not, if we proceed with this and do a representation review in, in next year, um, do we definitely have to do another representation review in 2024? If the council decides to go out and make and um, put a proposal out about Māori wards and if there was a change then yes you would need them to okay. do another representation. Okay and just um, in terms of the suggested pr um, process in the paper of a pre-consultation and then a, a further consultation, if pre-consultation happened and, it, and there wasn't an appetite for change, um, what would the cost of just the pre-consultation be? I haven't got the breakdown yeah. of the proposals in front of me. Um, potentially a third of of what we've put up to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Bart. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I was trying to find any benefits we are getting out of this review if we go ahead. Number one, I couldn't find anything mentioned about what we what would we gain out of this review if if it is about to reduce only to reduce the number of councillors or representation will it there be will there be any financial benefit for the council or the community so number one through you mr chair the we can't only go out about this particular issue we must go out about everything in the representation review so that's set out in the report um, number two, uh, the uh, amount that the remuneration authority sets for the council is decided by the size of the city. It's not decided by the number of councillors, so that wouldn't change. Okay. Can I ask another question? Is there a clear guidance in the Local Government Act about the number of councillors per capita or uh, related to the, the population of the city? No. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councillor Bailey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I think you may have answered my question, but I just want to seek a clarification. So we've done the electoral system and we've done the Maori wards. So if we pass this, this will trigger the wards. This will trigger um, whether we go for wards or not. Yes. So we, yeah, okay, that's answering my question. So it's not just about this if we, yeah, thank you. Uh, Councillor Johnson. Uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor, but uh, Councillor Butt asked my question, thank you. Great. All right, any further questions of Hannah? No, all right, thanks, Hannah. Right, um, we will go back to uh, the notice of motion um, and, and over to you, uh, Councillor Bowen. Thank you, Mr Mayor, and I just want to say thank you um, to yourself and the CE and to members for allowing me to bring, to bring this um, slightly out of the time sequence that we'd normally be looking at. And clearly my interest is moving away from the status quo, and that's why I specified that in the notice, because I felt it would be disingenuous to put that up without saying why I was doing that. Um, and from your questions, I think the question is, well, why, why now, why bother? And um, we've been asking the question since 1989, and we've not had a sense that the community are particularly bothered by this. Um, usually the submissions, and those of you who remember the 2018 
um, process will remember the submissions are very much focused on something else in 2018 that was about the wards question um, and Bunnythorpe in particular. And so when people say they have no view on the number of elected members, that's not generally them submitting on the number of elected members, they're submitting on something else. And as a, by the way, add in, they have no real view on elected members. I suppose we could say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. You know, why would we bother? Um, and I'm not saying we're broken. This isn't a comment on our current effectiveness or efficiency. It just asks us to consider, would smaller equal more effective or more efficient? We're lucky now to have a well-functioning council, but some of you remember when that wasn't the case, when factions were a thing and there was a lot of infighting. I'm asking, would a smaller council help to protect future council from those kind of issues? So it's clear the community's ambivalent on this, and I'm not surprised by that. Um, there's no right number, as came up in the question from Councillor Butt, if there was, the LGA would define it. Um, I'm sure we've all done a due diligence on this since the papers came out. Uh, the only guidance I could provide, find on the number, the right number for any board came from the Institute of Directors, who said medium to large size companies should have six to eight directors. Now, clearly we're not a company. We have a governance role, and we also have our elected representative role. So that might provide an interesting point of background, but it doesn't provide the answer. And when we go out and talk to our community about this, we've asked them if 16 is the right number, but we haven't given them any comparisons. We haven't said, you know, there are councils out there who have 10 and they seem to be doing a perfectly good job. So should we look at that? We've just said, is 16 the right number? So I'm not responding to a perceived need in the community. I want to be really clear about that. I think if we went out for pre-consultation, we still wouldn't hear a, a perceived need in the community. I'm responding to my own growing view that we haven't done our due diligence on this question. It's been lost in the conversation about big topics like wards, like Māori wards particularly. So in order to have that conversation, I'd suggest we need to set out clearly the perceived benefits, benefits and risks of change if we want our community to form a view. And my view is that that happens in the initial proposal stage. We know our, our numbers are a historical hangover from wards, from evening meetings, from a time when you could do the job of city councillor as well as hold down a full-time job, and some of you did that. Um, Citywide voting and STV have changed the landscape considerably, along with increased expectations of daytime availability, not just for council and committees, but for workshops, briefings, team meetings, working groups, appointment and funding panels. We're privileged to be trusted by our community <laughs> to do that, but we're also expected to look at the best way of doing that. And this isn't a decision that will affect any of us around this table for this triennium. I'm asking us to look at this so we put something in place for the next triennium. What I'm suggesting are the potential benefits about delivering a team that is enabled to work together to make effective decisions. It's the full participation of every member that contributes most to that. And with 16 voices around the table, that's actually really difficult to achieve. We all know that even managing our diaries outside of our regular Wednesday commitment is difficult. A small number would still meet diversity and skill expectations, although that is largely in the hands of the electorate. And noting that was a particular concern raised by Councillor Hancock, say the evidence shows that people are elected in the proportion in which they stand, not anything to do with the amount of seats that are available. So if we're serious about diversity, we need to increase the number of diverse members of our community that stand for election. What I think we're looking for is something that gives us adequate scale to spread the load, while at the same time discouraging factions and supporting individual views coming through, to maximise engagement without impacting on process and get a clearer line of sight on roles of responsibilities, enabling better representation for our community and more effective governance for the organisation. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, so you have... Um the resolution there um, around to undertake a representation review in 2021 so the outcomes can be in place for the 2022 election and the review includes specific um, consultation on reducing the number of elected members. Um, it's moved by yourself, seconded by me. Um, I'll open it up for any comments. Councillor Denison. 
Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Bowen, for bringing this um, notice forward. I think it's um, very reasonable to consider uh, the possibility of having uh, wider consultation on this issue. This has come up in the past, and when we specifically went out with a proposal to reduce the number of councillors, uh, it was some time ago, beyond, um, not sure the exact term we did that, uh, but the public feedback was very close on the support to reduce the councillors at that time down to 12. And so therefore, I believe with that much time that's now passed to go out on that specific question uh, to seek an update on the community view, I think is quite reasonable. I'm very open minded around uh, the representation. I certainly have a preference for the at large elections over ward. So <laughs> Um, I, I, I've seen both operate, um, and that's a personal view, um, and which has been supported for the change at the time. So I see no reason to change. I, I'm happy to state that view publicly. But as far as the number of councillors go, I think the question still remains. Uh, and 15 plus a mayor is quite large when you're looking at decision making bodies uh, to um, operate effectively. Uh, I don't want to compare ourselves to the Institute of Directors, which has been quoted um, by the mover uh, between six and eight, but certainly 15's, you know, at least double that figure. And uh, and so that's a point that's been made earlier. The other point around uh, the appeal for people to consider taking on a role, and this now with our meeting format and timing and um, calendar, it is challenging to hold down a full-time role. Uh, in fact, I'd almost say it'd be very rare for somebody to be able to hold down a full-time role. It'd be a fairly unique type of employment or um, business that, um, that would allow for that. And so therefore it limits so much of our population to consider candidacy for council. And so therefore I think the split of remuneration is a point, although less, uh, I see it, uh, uh, a step down as far as um, importance, but nevertheless, I think it's a point well made um, to recognise the the dedication and commitment that's required to fulfil uh, the, this representation opportunity well. Um, what we're deciding here is just whether we go out and approving the unbudgeted amount, which is thirty thousand. In the greater scheme of things, uh, I'm not uh, with respect uh, saying that thirty thousand is not a lot of money. But I think it's an investment to actually gain community views, and I think it's a worthwhile investment to confirm that we do have it right. Because if we have the opportunity to adjust it for the next triennium, I think we should. I don't think we should wait till the next term of council to uh, seek these views. Um, and I'm going to support the notice of motion. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Rutherford. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think I've um, come full circle on this issue. Um, when questions were raised earlier, um, I was really keen to see us have this conversation. But the more I've thought about it, I am concerned that our community are going to get consultation fatigue around this issue. We had a very heated review last term when um, our council decided to establish a Māori ward. Somebody phoned Don Brashen to get that overturned. And we asked that question alongside that discussion around uh, representation and the status quo remained. We've had early conversations as a part of this notice of motion with Iwi, who have indicated a preference for this conversation to take place next training uh, alongside the wider review. We know that research tells us that less representatives does equal a decrease in diversity. We know that. So where I've come to now is, is that I would like us to lead this review out next triennium with a strong proposal uh, to establish a Māori ward. I think that discussion needs to be had again. Um, and a wider review of elected members then, including our representation um, and what our council looks like. So at this stage, I won't be supporting this um, and look forward to us deferring this until next term. Uh, Councillor Dingwell. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so along similar lines to Alicia Rutherford, uh, sorry, Councillor Rutherford, um, I will not be supporting an early review for a few reasons. In 2010, we held the poll on representation issues. And at that time, there was significant appetite for reducing the number of councillors. I don't know much about that poll um, or the way that it was conducted, the publicity around it, all of that. But I can say that 10 years is a very long time in politics. We asked the public again in 2018, and there was not significant appetite for um, reducing the amount of councillors. Mm -hmm. Rangatane don't see the need for this. So I don't think this early review is coming from the community. It's coming from councillors. And one of the reasons could be to do with how much we're paid. Um, my understanding is that the remuneration authority sets out how much we get as a collective group. And in my very first council meeting, which was less than a year ago, we all decided how that was going to be split up. Um, and so changing the amount of councillors would not change the cost to the ratepayers, but it would give individual councillors more money. Now, as one of the least paid councillors at this table, I just want to state for the record that 47k is actually not bad, um, especially for the, the kind of work that we do. We are not here to get rich, we're here to serve our community. There is plenty of people in this city who work very hard and don't earn that much. Um, I don't know who's complaining about pay, but it certainly isn't me. Some councillors might feel that they need more money because they have higher responsibilities, higher workloads. But the way that roles are distributed is that we all have meetings with the mayor um, at the beginning of the, the year, and he decides who goes on what committees, who has what portfolios, um, and who ends up being on external committees as well. And when you look at each of our responsibilities, some people have more of those than others. I, for one, am not a chair, am not a deputy chair, have no lead portfolios. And in fact, I'm the only councillor here who's, who doesn't have any of those. So if councillors feel that they have too much work, maybe they shouldn't be putting their hands up for everything. Looking around the table now, we are one of the better councils in this country because we do have quite a lot of diversity. Um, I'm proud to be the first Pacifica woman at this council table. And I can tell you that it's actually quite hard to get here. There's a lot of work that had to happen for me to even be here. Um, and, sorry, I did have a couple more. Um, and so with that, in terms of diversity, we're doing a great job, but actually we're not even, we're, you know, in terms of comparing to everybody else, we're good, but we've still got more work to do. We don't have any Māori representation at this table. And we don't have anyone under 30 at this table. So there's still more work to do in this space. And having less councillors will put that at risk. So right now, we're still dealing with COVID-19. And we literally just went back into alert level one yesterday. Who knows what the future holds in the next couple of years? We should be really careful about what we're focused on and how we support our community and how we pay for that. This $30,000 unbudgeted expense, it, you know, sure, it could be explained a few different ways, but it's, it's not just about the money. It's about the time and energy and resources that could be going towards more pressing issues like a rates review or getting the public involved in consultations where the focus is on how we help them and not how they can help us. So I actually have heaps more reasons why we shouldn't be doing this, but I'll leave it there. Thank you. Councillor Meehan. A point of clarification, Mr. Mayor. I'm 30 for another two weeks. <laughs> I, I was going to point that out, and there's some other, um, other facts that were embellished, but I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just, just a couple of points, but hard act to follow, I'd like to commend uh, Councillor Dingwall. Um, it was it was mentioned um, by the mover that functions within the ranks when we've got large numbers. Um, I'd just like to say I've been involved with sports teams for a number of years, and it doesn't matter whether you've got four on your team or you've got 40 in your team. 
they can be split some of the functions um, in the groups. Um, I don't see any valuable reason for this motion other than councillors to receive more dollars in their pocket. It's the only value I can see in it. I see no value to the community at all. We talk about diversity. Um, I don't care which way you look at it and how you look at it. Diversity and more numbers than less, than less numbers. There's got to be. It's just simple. I, I can't see any other way around that. Um, to spend thirty thousand dollars. That's been said thirty thousand. Actually, when I read the report, it says twenty to forty. And I haven't known many times this council drew on the lesser side than the greater side. So it's probably forty thousand um, dollars. EV representation. Have said clearly they don't see the sense in it. So I think the view has been well and truly covered that at this time we've got a uh, representation review coming up in a couple of years time, three years time. Why would we waste our time doing it now when there's so many other things that this council is currently working on and a lot bigger and more important projects? Thank you. Councillor Barrett. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And before uh, speaking specifically to the motion, I'd like to to acknowledge the mover and and the seconder for actually bringing this to the table. For while I don't share their views, I do share the view that elected members setting direction, bringing debate to this table, is a very very positive way to operate as a council. So greatly appreciate um, Councilor Bowen and the Mayor for bringing this to us. However, it is not a proposal that I can see myself. Um, supporting an effect, I think that the community, um, whether it's today or at any time in the future, should be quite cautious about this sort of initiative and direction. If this were successful, <clears throat> it would clearly concentrate power into fewer hands. It would cost us in terms of diversity, and it would cost us in terms of access to representation. And to me, all that adds up to a, a weakening of our democracy and representation in the community. And so I'm left with asking, where is the community benefit on this? And I simply don't see any benefit to our constituents whom we serve. I think in the future, when we do get to a representation review, <clears throat> excuse me, we should be very focused at that point on ensuring that we actually address some of the root issues, such as voter participation, such as engagement at this council table when we go out and speak with the community on that. But at this point, I see absolutely no reason for us to support this, and I will be voting accordingly. I think we need to make sure that in future, the community has access to both scale and diversity of representation, rather than concentrating power in a few hands. Councillor Happeter. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, I also commend the mover and the seconder for bringing this forward, but um, I won't be supporting this. Um, I also um, think what Councillor Butt said, where he did bring up that where are the benefits in this, and I don't see any benefits that have been brought forward for bringing this to bringing this motion forward now. They don't see any clear benefits to the community. And we do need to see more benefits when we bring a motion forward, because what is what's the whiffum? What's in it for us now? And there isn't anything in in it for the community, and anything in it for it for the council. We actually have to see that before we actually can really run with it, and and that's not there. And I think for us to to have that and for the heart of our community, I can't really see that there. So that's why I can't really support it going forward. Um, I do think a lot of it's already been said, but that's why I won't be supporting it. Um, but thank you for bringing it forward. Uh, Councillor Naylor. Thank you, Mr Mayor. And I'd like to thank um, Councillor Bowen for bringing this important issue um, to the table. Um, I, I'm a, I've been a part of two other boards um, currently and recently, um, both of which have 11 people around the table. And I would have, my my view is that that number is a more effective decision-making sized group than 16. Um, however, I came to the meeting today very much on the, on the fence about this, and I've, I've spent a bit of time considering it over the past few days. Um, and I guess where I sit on the fence 
is, is more about timing. I think it's an important issue for us to consider. Um, I guess my question is, is, is next year the right time to consider it? Um, I, I won't be supporting um, pr progressing with it next year. However, I think it's something that we need to put um, high in the priority list when we do do our next representation review, um, because I do think there's some different issues in terms of the functioning of this council and the way we operate. Um, and there's some issues around workload. And I mean, I'm unsure as to whether workload issues are addressed by having less of us or more of us. I mean, there's, there's cons and pros both ways. But when I look at next year, in terms of our consultation with our community, we've got some really big things to consult. We've got the wastewater um, that we're in current consultation with, um, and obviously we've got our long-term plan, but we'll have our long-term plan in 2024 as well. Um, so whilst I, I appreciate, and I think it would be good for us to address this, I do. I don't see that the benefits in addressing it next year outweigh perhaps the um, waiting for another three years. And part of where I've come to on that is the consideration of Māori wards. And if that's to be a part of the discussion, I think it would be better to have this conversation with that as a part of the context. So if we're to have a few seats around the table, which are Māori ward seats, that may well affect um, the number that we think is appropriate to have around the table. So I think it would make more sense for us to have that conversation at the same time if we are considering Māori wards. Thank you. Councillor Finlay. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I came here today and um, honestly didn't know which way to vote. I was going to abstain. Um, but I've listened to the arguments and what's been said. And in the past, I have supported uh, less councillors because of the arguing and the bickering and some of those things we had had to put up in the past. But I look at this council and I thought, now, if we were down to 12 members, how would it affect this council? We would lose an awful lot of our diversity. Think about it. Those last three people that got on, they wouldn't be here today. Now, wouldn't we be so much worse off if they weren't here? It's opened up a lot of different uh, areas to the council and understanding to the councillors because those people are here. Yes, councillors would get more kudos if it was down to 10 and 12 and they'd be doing more work around the community. Goodness me, I'm doing enough anyway. But and they'll get more money, but I'm not here for the money and I'm not here for the kudos. I'm here for the people of Farmers North. And when I look around this council and how diverse we are and how well we represent our community, how could I possibly vote for less? So I will not be supporting this. OK, no further councillors. I, I will just um, say a few words and then pass back to you, Councillor Bowen, for write a reply. Look, councillors, um, we, we, I've heard many, many of you talking about being a leading, an agile council. But I'll just leave you with a comment. Turkeys don't vote for Christmas normally. And uh, there, there's, there is an element of this here. Um, I've heard that uh, we'll lose diversity, but this council has long held uh, STV and in and, and more recent times at large voting, and that actually has increased diversity, certainly STV. I look at other councils that are very similar to us, Dunedin, Hutt, and we're not even close in the amount of uh, number of electors um, to a councillor. And I think there is an element of uh, looking, asking the question, or certainly testing, do we have the right numbers around the table? Uh, to, it's interesting, local government reform, there is just so much negativity about seeking tradition, you know, staying with status quo, no, we can't cha change, all the issues. And some of you have brought those up. And some of you are relatively new um, and, uh, and, and, have, and have brought your um, uh, piece or, or, or um, comments to the table. I do believe that we have to ask the question. Uh, 
maybe the timing uh, could be better, but we're bound by legislation. And as I said, um, councils are unique organisations, and sometimes we're governed by pieces of legislation which don't help us. I think we need to ask the question of, of our community, do we have the right amount of people around the table? Will diversity still be protected? I think it will with STV and uh, city at large. Do we open up the wards? Do we open up the community boards discussion? Yes, we do, but that's okay. There's no, there's no harm there. I understand some of you uh, um, want to bring the Māori ward thing up again. Um, we, we can't do that, and that's been clearly, again, that legislation doesn't allow us to. But please, at least have an open mind about what we can possibly do. There's no harm in, in asking the question. We haven't made a decision on it because the community will, will certainly dictate towards that. Thank you. I'll pass to you, Councillor Barnum. Thank you, Mr Matt. So, uh, you know, reading the room, <laughs> I'm not going to spend hours hashing this back out again. Um, but I suppose what you know with me is I'm not going to die wondering. If there's a question to be asked, then I'm going to ask it. And I thank you for your support for us having the conversation here in this room. It shows that we can um, debate what might be quite difficult or contentious issues in a productive way and come to a position where at least we all know what we all think. And I think that is a hallmark of good democratic process. And there have been some really good points made um, on both sides, I'd say, of this argument, um, particularly around consultation fatigue. I think that is a big issue for all councils. Um, and as the mayor alluded to, you know, we are bound by legislation in having to consult and the prescribed ways that we have to do that. If we went ahead with this, my preference would clearly have been for there to be no pre-consultation, um, because I think it does cause confusion. And we've seen that in many of our processes recently. I think the Māori wards question is going to be an interesting one again. And my concern is that, again, this question gets lost in that bigger conversation because those are, there might not be more important questions, but they're certainly more engaging questions. And that's what we saw last time around is that it becomes a single issue representation review. And I can quite easily see that happening again if we go down the Māori wards question, which is a decision for the next council. As, of course, lots of this is, it impacts on the next council. It's not about any of us seeking more pay because it wouldn't affect the pay that we get. It's about asking if we have the right number of people around the table being appropriately remunerated for the job that they do. I personally think that if we had fewer and as a result they were paid more, that would increase the number of people who might consider standing for council, which in turn might increase diversity but we don't know any of that until we test it. Um, so arguments on both sides and entirely hypothetical until we test it. Um, interesting comments about if we do this, then we can't do other things like a rates review. A, we are doing a rates review, that's on our books. And B, it's not a zero sum game. It's not if we do this, we can't do that. If we decide we're doing something, then officers go and make it happen. They put up a budget and they do it because that's been the direction we've given. If they want to not do something, they'd have to come back here and get that permission. So this isn't a zero sum game. If we decide to do one thing, it doesn't mean we don't do something else. I, I really appreciated Councillor Barrett's thoughtful comments on the community should be cautious about concentrating power in a few hands. It's possibly a slightly dark and post apocalyptic view, but good, good point well made, I thought. Um, I, it's not a concern I share. I think if we were going down to three people, you might be right, but I think a 12 to 14 sized council wouldn't be a particular threat to life of the universe and everything. So are there benefits? Well, I, I think there are, because that's why I brought it up. Is the timing perfect? No, it definitely isn't. It never is in local government. Um, and we're all here for the people. That's why we do it. Nobody around this table is here for the money. We all know that. We're here for the people and to do the best job we can. My question is, does having few of us around the table enable us to do a better job? And you will vote depending on whether you think that's a question we need to answer now. So thank you for listening. All right, thank you, councillors. We've uh, debated that well and truly. So uh, we have the uh, uh, motion in front of you. I'll ask you to vote, please.
and that has failed 13, uh, three votes for and 13 against. Thank you. All right, we'll move now to number seven, which is another notice of motion, uh, Fenua Planting Options, page um, 41, uh, and that's from Councillor Naylor. Councillor Naylor. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, Fenua planting is based on a cultural, a traditional practice where um, families bury their placenta or fenua and pito or umbilical cords um, and returning it to Papatua, Papatua Nuku. Um, I'd just like to acknowledge um, Jennifer Green in here today, who's a midwife, and also Amanda Douglas, who is the um, local New Zealand College of Midwives um, co-chair. Um, and it was Jennifer on behalf of midwives that brought this idea to me um, to ask if I would um, pro see if I could progressing it through council. And the purpose for that is that um, there's an opportunity for council to be an enabler with this idea, to be able to provide a place for families to do this, um, perhaps on a public reserve or a public piece of land. Um, the the custom is becoming very popular and widely utilised in our community, but families often struggle to find an appropriate place to do it because they're in a rental property or if they're, even if they're in a property that they own, they may not be there long term. And they, for some families, they'd like it to be a place that they can go back and return and visit to. Um, so I think this is a really great initiative. It's done by other, uh, other councils uh, around the place and there's some, some examples of how um, that is quite easily enabled. An example is in Nelson, where they do provide an opportunity once a year um, at a place where council is, is doing some planting anyway and provide that opportunity for um, families to come and bury their placenta. Um, I think it's a great idea and I'd encourage you to support it. Thank you, councillor. Um, and uh, other, uh, other speakers to this, um, councillor Rutherford. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I am very excited about um, the opportunity that this proposal brings. Um, I think that what we're starting to see is uh, women birthing in Aotearoa are wanting to um, strengthen the connection that they have to this place. As Councillor Naylor said, we're, we're seeing more people renting and um, for women who have birthed and have kept the placenta of their baby, you can only keep that in the freezer for so long. Um, We've got an opportunity here to work in partnership um, with our iwi to identify a, a shared community space where we can enable this to happen. Um, I think providing an opportunity to support our community uh, to reconnect or um, to further connect their babies back to our land um, in a permissive way um, in partnership is only got benefits. I, I can't see anything um, negative around this. So I'm really excited to support this uh, and I would encourage all of you to do so. Thank you, councillors. I'll open it up for further um, comments. Uh, Councillor Barton. Thank you. Uh, thanks to Councillor Naylor and Councillor Rutherford for bringing this forward. I'm really pleased to be speaking in support of it. Um, cl clearly, this isn't part of my cultural tradition, but I've given birth to all of my children here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and I was really intrigued um, at the, the first time I gave birth here when this cultural practice was um, mentioned in our antenatal class, and it made so much sense to me that that's something that families would want to do. And I think if we can find a way to facilitate that appropriately, respectfully, and doing due diligence about where, where that might be, then I would love to see us do that, and I'd really encourage you to support it. Uh, Councillor Denison and then Councillor uh, Harpeter. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, yeah, I'm going to support it. I've um, married into the uh, into the um, Māori culture that um, have practised this and um, had to dig and bury my children's placenta in my mother-in-law's backyard. And, it's, it, and, and to think that um, many other families that are renting and living in short-term accommodation don't get that opportunity to have it at the homestead. Um, and I, I think it has such a significance. I think it's quite beautiful. And the fact that this has come forward, I think it actually would uh, be appropriate for us to do. And I'd be very honoured to support this. Thank you. Councillor Harper. Just a question to officers. Um, 
any thoughts about cost? I know it's a horrible question to ask, but and also whereabouts that we were thinking. Um, I was going to come to that eventually, but you've, you've jumped it. Yep. Uh, we haven't looked at that at this stage. We'll wait to see whether this passes or not, and I'll be able to come back at the next council meeting with a um, with a more indication of time and cost, but of of developing this and timings on it. But at this stage, not looking at any new work on our program this side of Christmas. Can I just comment? Um, I fully support this as well, along with Councillor Dents, and I also married into Mary. Um, uh, but also um, fully support this. I think this is a great initiative and I, I commend Councillor Naylor and Councillor Rutherford to bring this to Council. I think it's a great initiative for the Council to support and I think it's something that as a community we should be all on board with. So hopefully all councillors will fully support it. Uh, Councillor Dingwell. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, Councillor Hapdell already asked my questions, that's fine. Um, I also just want to say that I'm hugely supportive of this motion. I have a few friends and family members who actually currently have their placentas in their freezers. And that's that's an awkward situation to be in because, um, you know, some of them think about um, actually giving it to my mum to, 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 you know, bury in her area. But she lives in Auckland and she doesn't actually have anywhere to bury it. So it's it's I think it's. I think it's timely um, because we are in the middle of a massive housing crisis at the moment throughout the country. Um, I think it is important that we do start looking after the cultural aspects um, of our people. And and I'm really thankful to Councillor Naylor and Councillor Rutherford for bringing it forward. All right, um, I'll go write a reply to you, Councillor Naylor. Thank you. Don't have too much um, further to add, but just to um, address a couple of the questions that Councillor Harpeter raised. One, she asked where, and I, I think um, what I've proposed in, is, is for this to be progressed in partnership with local iwi, and I think that would be a really appropriate way for it to be progressed. And so I would consider that the where um, we would get some advice and guidance from them as to where they may see uh, that uh, where the place might be appropriate and um, in terms of the cost as well as the place I guess I th I'd like to see that we're practical about this so it's not about having to buy a new piece of land and deliberately dig you know planting it's about where are we doing planting anyway you know where and so it, you know it may well be that um, there's some planting happening at a certain reserve, so council can put the word out that on this Saturday or whatever day the, the whenua planting will, will happen and it'll be where plants are being planted anyway. So it can certainly happen, I think, very simply without needing a lot of additional resource, I would hope, but certainly we can hope, um, wait and get that advice back. But thank you. All right, councillors. Um we will go to the vote, please. It's passed 16 votes for, uh, none against. Now we'll move through to our reports and number eight on our, on our agenda is our corporate emissions inventory and management plan. And I'll ask, um, our city acting city planning manager to come forward. Uh, it's on page 43. And Adam Jarvis, if he's here. Kia ora koutou, councillors, uh, Mr Mayor. Um, so this is a follow-up from the report that went to the Environmental Sustainability Committee. Uh, we now have our subject matter expert here, um, Adam Jarvis. Um, so um, as you would have seen um, from the email that came out from Hannah, we've circulated um, the questions from the three councillors that um, uh, were asked at the committee um, and a written response has been provided to those. 
Um, so in, in terms of today, I guess there's kind of two options. Adam can either summarise those questions and answers, or if those councillors would like to ask those questions, um, um, we can respond to them. Um, so, uh, Mr. Mayor, I'm happy to, to do either. Um, I guess just before I would start as well, I'd just like to acknowledge um, since Adam last presented uh, to the committee or, or council, there has been a slight change in Adam's role. So um, when he first joined us um, simply five years ago, he was employed as a poly, policy, policy analyst, um, environmental sustainability. Um, he is now our senior climate change advisor. Um, so we're in your hands as to whether you'd like us to summarise um, the questions and answers being received and circulated yeah. or allow the councillors to ask those. Um, well, I'll, I'll allow both, but um, yeah. perhaps you do a summary and and I know Councillor Butt especially had, had some questions and I know they've been answered, um, but perhaps you just give a summary there and then I'll allow councillors to um, to ask any further questions because I think it's, it's worthy of discussion um, and uh, um, I actually think it's uh, it's a very positive report. Uh, to Mr. Mayor, to Nako to Katoa councillors. Um, so you will have seen the uh, response um, uh, provided to <coughs> the questions I've received so far. Um, I think generally there's a, a series of um, questions regarding the scope of the inventory. Uh, so, for example, uh, regarding workplace travel. Um, issues around uh, um, other activities happening at the Lido, uh, what's in and what's out, essentially. Um, and what I can tell you there in the, in the first instance is that um, we're following um, um, uh, standard reporting guidelines uh, from Ministry for the Environment. So in that case, um, with the exception of workplace travel, and I, as I've indicated there, everything that we report, is, we're required to report. Um, so uh, there are a few interesting edge cases, um, such as have been raised with the uh, activities at the Lido, um, but at the end of the day, we pay for the power. Um, obviously, there's a degree to which that's on charge through their leasing arrangements, but we own the facility and we pay the power bills. So if you, as a general rule, if that's the case, then we've included it in our emissions. Um, the exception there being, sorry, uh, not the exception, um, this issue of workplace travel, we've um, made the judgment as officers to include that uh, as, as a, a what's known as scope three additional, and in effect means that it's uh, optional for us to include. Uh, we've made the judgment to do that given the council's strategic direction um, and the, the passage of the uh, sustainability, sorry, the sustainable practices strategy that I've um, quoted in that. Uh, so that's that's on scope. Happy to take any more questions you might have on that. Um, the other issue I just wanted to, uh, only other issue I really wanted to um, touch on um, was that, um, as councillors have noted, the uh, um, figure, the, the, the figures that we reported for the baseline year of 2015-16 um, have changed. So the report that was originally presented to you in 2018 um, quoted, and I'm sorry, I don't have the figures um, here to hand, but um, that our total emissions as a council was something in the order of 31,000, 32,000. Um, and we've since revised that based on um, uh, to 26,000. So we've reissued that baseline report. Now, the reason for that is, is that that original baseline report took um, the, uh, actually, I'll take one step back. There's this idea of carbon dioxide equivalent. So um, there's a little abbreviation, CO2E. People ask me what the E is about. It means equivalent. So it's, it's taking all greenhouse gases and then kind of consolidating into a single number that can be compared across years. And the way that we do that is we take, uh, so the main, main greenhouse gases that we have are obviously carbon and methane. Um, there's a range of uh, nitrous oxides and, and trace amounts of uh, um, refrigerants, but for, for the most part, we're talking about carbon dioxide and methane. And the conversion of our tons of methane to tons of carbon dioxide equivalent is done through a, 
emissions factor that MFE um, uh, set countrywide. Now, the, the, the point I'm making here, uh, the ultimate point, and the reason for the change in the baseline year is that the emissions factor to change, uh, to convert methane has gone from 32 to 26 or so. Um, so that's been a revision. And so as so that we can compare today's emissions uh, equally and fairly with the emissions of 2015-16, we've revised that number um, so that it can be compared across years. Um, I think I'll leave my comments there. I'm happy to um, answer any further questions you might have, or um, hopefully I've, that uh, an explanation makes sense. Thank, thank you, Adam. I think um, some of those um, some of those uh, uh, comments I think will, will will help councillors. It certainly helped me in understanding why why the ministry had made a change. So um, thank you for that. I'll open it up for any questions. Um, Councillor Johnson. Uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. So I just intend to repeat the questions that I had at committee, um, recognising the officers have provided written response, but I think it's important that um, we hear a public response. Um, given that the written responses are not available to the public. So are you okay with that? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, no problems. Um, so I had three questions. So uh, the first one was around um, the basis of the methane calculations. And I think um, Mr. Jarvis has answered that uh, pretty much. Um, but um, could you just go into the detail of how we calculate the methane uh, from the closed landfill? And on what basis that's calculated, given that uh, there's no more uh, rubbish being added to that landfill? Uh, sure. Um, through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, um, there is no longer any uh, waste being added to Alpeni landfill um, since 2007 when the landfill was closed. Um, we actually have another very small landfill, which I understand we took over from Rua um, Borough Council, um, which was closed many decades ago uh, over on uh, towards Ashurst, which is um, vanishingly small by comparison to Alpuni, but we do include that as well. Um, the, it's no longer waste, however, uh, being deposited. However, the waste that has been deposited is decaying and it's releasing methane as it does so. Um, we, uh, knowing exactly how much methane is being released is um, impossible because um, you'd have to capture it all um, in order to measure it. Um, but we do have some, of our, some idea both um, through the gas capture system that we have installed at the landfill, um, which we capture part of the methane that's emitted, use it to power the wastewater treatment plant, um, and we also um, match this up with a uh, um, mathematical model that uses um, the known volumes of waste that were deposited at Awapuni um, and the consent conditions that we have, the old consent conditions that we have for Ashurst, and the, the um, nationwide averages for the um, composition of that waste. And then we use um, based on uh, uh, data that we have for other landfills uh, uh, around the country and the world, um, standard decay rate for that. And then for it, so um, that's how the methane emissions of that landfill are calculated. Um, and I hope, again, that uh, explanation uh, satisfactory. Yes, thank you. Very helpful. Um, second question was about the forestry blocks and how we uh, calculate our emissions when we harvest a block of forestry. So is there a spike in our emissions that year or is there an averaging process? Uh, so again, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, I, uh, as I note in the um, written response, we do actually have 37 different forestry blocks that we um, keep track of. A uh, number of these are exotic um, commercial blocks, and then there's a large, uh, obviously, um, regenerating native blocks as well. Um, and uh, to answer your uh, council question, um, we, when 
that particular block is har when a particular block is harvested, the emissions associated with that is um, uh, um, that harvesting is included in our inventory for that year. Uh, however, um, given that there's so many and we blocks and we don't harvest any great number in any one given year, it tends to average out uh, across the years in any case. Thank you. And then and my final question was around whether or not it was usual to include staff travel in terms of calculations of emissions of an organisation. So staff travel to work rather than staff travel while at work. Um, so again, I, uh, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, um, it, I would say it is not, um, it's, it is common um, for organisations to do so, um, but it is, it, it, I don't know if I could say most. I don't have exact data on the number of organisations that choose to report it, uh, though like I said, it is um, optional for us to do so. Um, so given that it's optional, um, can you uh, explain the rationale for including it for the decision that, that you presumably made to include it? Indeed. Uh, so um, in the Active and Public Transport Plan and um, most particularly in the Sustainable Practices Plan of Council's strategy, the strategic suite, um, there is specific direction uh, regarding the uh, encourage more staff to carpool and use active transport to commute to work. Um, so uh, as a result of that being um, part of Council's public strategic direction, we've um, de deemed it was appropriate to include um, progress on that um, uh, particular note, um, or at least with respect to the carbon impact of progress uh, in this inventory. Uh, however, um, uh, like I've said, happy to take councillors uh, um, guidance on that matter as it is an optional uh, um, inclusion. Thank you. Councillor Barrett. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, David and, and Adam for the report and congrats on the new role. A um, couple questions that I have. First one is just around um, making this information more, more publicly available as our, our citywide um, emissions profile inventory has, has been published on the council website. Is, is there any reason or rationale why we wouldn't um, consider publishing these um, organizational inventories alongside that? Uh, well, uh, again, through you, Mr. Mayor, I, um, these are reports are published publicly. Uh, it may well be that um, they aren't as uh, um, promoted as they could be, and certainly something we can look at. Great, thank you. Um, second question was just, I guess, trying to understand what would be possible in terms of scope, because obviously a lot of the work that we commission, um, you know, is through contractors and isn't currently um, seen or it's waste that we're exporting to other districts and so we're not um, accounting for it and just if you could comment on I guess what would be possible in terms of of over time beginning to address those additional matters and bring them into um, into our inventories uh, again through Mr. Mayor I that's it's an interesting question um, the, the approach that we currently take is to consider, well, if everybody did one of these inventories, would we be um, double counting? Uh, so if our contractor, um, as some of them do, uh, but measure their own um, emissions, uh, would, would we be also in measuring those of same emissions as well and including the now inventory. So in other words, if everybody in the country did one of these or every organisation, would we then capture uh, or significantly overestimate the total emissions? Um, and I think this is partly where the question of um, uh, having both an organisational inventory, which is more limited in scope, and also a citywide inventory, which can um, includes all of the uh, um, uh, emissions resulting from activities within the city, including the production of um, waste, uh, 
uh, and, and uh, just as a minor note, this inventory as well does include emissions resulting from our waste, um, even though they are um, ultimately deposited outside of the district because we produce them. Uh, thinking again back to the rule I kind of mentioned earlier, if it's we're paying for the power, if we're producing it, we're controlling the activity, um, we're currently including that within the scope. Um, shifting to a different rule that was more inclusive um, is possible, um, but would be uh, not only um, a significant amount of work, but would create a, a disconnect, I suppose, in the comparability between this report and um, previous, sorry, future reports and the ones that have already been completed. All right, thank you, Adam. Yeah. Right. One final question, um, which is just around sort of looking looking ahead to understand our ability to um, uh, forecast or or predict um, what our trajectory looks like in in the future, and sort of how well we're positioned um, for that. And I guess the, the genesis of that question is as we are appreciative of seeing the um, emissions management plans as they come through, but they don't have a, a very long lead time in front of them. In fact, quite often they're sort of just current. So questions around how far into the future we can um, forecast. Sure. So um, as councillors may recall, um, when we, we we discussed this over lockdown during a um, carbon management workshop, um, I think you were all in this room, or many of you, but I was up there. Uh, sorry, the, um, the issue that we have is that um, as far as the council's current direction uh, in, in, in funding through the long-term plan um, goes, we have completed that suite of work um, with a few minor things to go. And so it, it's really up to council in terms of um, what kind of investment it wants to make in terms of carbon reductions in the future. Uh, and then, of course, once we have an idea of what kind of resourcing would be available, then we can make some predictions about uh, um, what kinds of reductions might be possible with that funding. Um, but at the moment, uh, until we know what it is that we're going to be doing in the future, it's difficult to make any sort of estimate about what the impact of on emissions might be. So, so just to add to that, to uh, Councillor Barrett, there are some uh, programs that you'll be able to consider as part of the long-term plan process, and in particular um, the climate change plan. Um, so there is a workshop this afternoon where we're starting to work through those those plans and programs. But obviously, those will need to be prioritised alongside um, a whole range of other programs um, mm -hmm. as part of the next LTP. Thank you both. Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councillor Bart. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Adam. Um, Mr. Mayor, I have plenty of questions, but I guess I'll do a couple of general questions, and then I would like to have a one-to-one -one conversation yeah. with yep. him. Definitely. So can I ask, in what shape do you hand over this report to EnviroCare for assessment? Is it in the same shape? we have been provided or it's a different format? Look, um, for you, Mr. Mayor, it's the same format. Um, there's a few, uh, inevitably a few tweaks that end up being made through the auditing process. Um, uh, numbers that needs to be changed, uh, some details around yeah. the discussion and so forth, but the format is the same both. In so the, the pre question I want to ask is, is it the same format the ministry has advised or EnviroCare has advised? And is it the case that all the councillors are doing the same format, same? Um, so the uh, carbon reduced program is a, is a third party, pres presented by a third party. It's based upon Ministry for the Environment guidelines. Um, but the program itself is a, is a private company that is owned by Monarchy Whenua, and so mm -hmm. thus through the Crown. Um, however, uh, it, participation in the program is optional. 
So um, not every council tracks their emissions and not every council that does track their emissions uses this program. However, a, a fair number do. Okay, thank you. Um, I guess there are, I mean, inconsistencies of the figures, the numbers of the same sectors in the same report. It might be a auto calculation or something to do with the spreadsheets, but there is a difference of sometimes 500 tons and sometimes over 500 tons of the same, same, I mean, report. So I'll discuss it with you. Just one thing on in 6.5, it says the report hasn't considered any deforestation figures or that the, the organization hasn't done any deforestation, but table five says deforestation and as a result, there is a huge emission reported here. And somewhere in the report, you said that this deforestation emissions have been subtracted from the overall sequestration. So if you consider the overall sequestra sequestration and consider these emissions, and if, if you consider that sequestration, that will balance the whole emission almost. There, there is nothing left in emissions then. If, because the it says it's about 975,000 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent sequestration. Sorry, just, just so I can follow along with you here. Can you it's a, it's a table. Page? It's a table number seven. It's uh, page seven of the report, page seven of the report. Okay. Yes. So. Uh, right, so some um, a lot of the language being used here is quite technical. Mm -hmm. um, the the figure that you're referring to there of um, nearly a million tons, 975,000 mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. uh, page seven or page 54 of the order paper um, is, a, is an indication of the total uh, carbon that it has been sequestered and that we have responsibility for. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it's, it's, it's something we're required to report on as part of the plan, but it's, 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 a, it's a stock, not a flow, if that makes sense. So in other words, it's, if, it's an indication of if all of our forestry burnt down tomorrow, um, it would release 975,000 tonnes of carbon. Um, but it's just sitting there, so it's not it's not a um, it's not being emitted or sequestered. It's the total over over time. So as the forestry blocks have all grown, some of them are fifty years old, and many of them are much yeah, younger. Each year they've sequestered carbon, and that figure that you see on table seven is a is an indication of the total amount of carbon that all of our forestry stocks in the all of years that they've been growing have sequestered. And it belongs to city council. Well, the li it's, a, it, it's, it's a liability in a, it, car well, what we call a carbon liability in the sense that it's it's something that we have to manage and, and it, yeah, it belongs to us yes, in a sense. So it should have been subject, subtracted from the total emissions then, like no, the, no, the New Zealand National Inventory does. They they subtract the whole sequestration from the emissions, annual emissions, and then report the final figures. Anyway, no, 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 I'll, I'll leave it there and I'll talk to you what? later. Councillor, can I can I suggest that? I mean, I know you and I have discussed this previously. You've got a number of questions and they're very technical. Um, and look, um, I have no doubt they have real relevance. But can I suggest that um, you have a, an audience with both David and Adam um, go through those? If you have any further. Um, I suppose, um, comments or issues from that, you have very welcome to bring them back to council. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Dingwell. Thank you, Mr Mayor, and thank you, Adam and David, for this report. Um, just to clarify, uh, are we collecting data on our current municipal waste? Uh, so we... Um, when you say our... What do you mean? 
Well, it, it, in the report, it says that this reduction um, should be viewed as a consequence of the outsourcing of municipal waste management since the closure of the Alpuni landfill. So we're measuring that the, the stuff at the land that at Alpuni, but what about the, the stuff that we've been outsourcing? Is that getting measured? Uh, so uh, a few points here. Um, um, excuse me. The uh, waste that's produced at council facilities um, or, or deposited in uh, council bins and parks um, and so forth, all of that is included in this report. Um, and like you suggest, um, the responsibility for emissions at Awapuni, um, that's also included in this report as well. Waste that's being produced by a third party, a private company, uh, cafes and so forth, um, that, and, and that goes to uh, um, Bonnie Glen Landfill, we don't account for that through here, but we do account for it through the citywide carbon inventory. Thank you. So, so it is measured, um, but we don't take direct responsibility for it as a council, just as, uh, as but we do take responsibility for it as a city. And so we do measure it, yes. Okay, and so uh, uh, is the data for for that um, reported anywhere? Um, that you mean um, the third party waste? The third party waste. Uh, yes, just not. It's not. Doesn't touch councils' operations, or um, so it's not reported as part of the corporate emissions inventory but it absolutely is included in the citywide inventory okay. reported there. And that's on our website and uh, it's currently being consulted on as part of the um, so council calculator. Yeah, so councillor, this is about our, 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 our council, yeah. corporate emissions. It's not about, um, you know, uh, residents as yeah. such. Yeah, that's cool. Um, so council recently held the, um, the Creative Cities conversation with Craig Pocock um, on on carbon landscape, um, and that was an interesting talk on on what ways that councils could reduce carbon emissions. And they had you know some big ideas, which possibly we'll see in a workshop or um, later down the track. But they were also talking about little things like encouraging the use of meadows rather than English style cut lawns. Um, and I see in here that one of the the measurements that we have is around um less mowing and so is that is that kind of what we're thinking in terms of getting those kind of emissions down hmm. uh that's a, a risk of being coming very technical um when it comes to that but i'll try to keep it high level um the, i i wasn't a, uh, able to attend that particular lecture and, uh, so i can't comment on um that However, um, generally what, what happens is uh, um, it's not just the emissions from the mowing, but also depending on what you're doing and the way you're treating the land, more carbon can be sequestered in the soil, the topsoil itself, more organic matter. Um, and so that's that's the benefit of that. Um, as far as mowing is concerned, uh, it was, as indicated in the emissions management reduction plan, uh, it's something that we trialled and that has um, been successful uh, down at uh, Ahimate Reserve, where we um, are, are allowing a, a more wild um, type look. And, and, and the, that we do that for a whole range of reasons, one of which is to reduce our um, operational costs. There's a bit of carbon um, benefit to it, but largely it was about the amenity of that particular space and creating a more um, sort of a wild experience for individuals. So um, it, it's not probably something that we're considering doing purely for a carbon management point of view. Okay. Although we, so, uh, yeah, so I guess we can't, but. I guess where I'm coming from from that is, are there things basically that we can be or should be doing that that isn't um, hugely budget intensive? And is that is that going to be um, just you know done in operations or in a report somewhere? 
Sure. Um, I would say, I, I, just in order to keep my comments brief, I would say that, like I said um, back in May, uh, the evidence that we have is that the majority of the emissions um, um, reductions that are possible are capital intensive. And that the work that we have done and, and been, uh, you know, in some cases been successful doing at the operational level have had very minimal benefit in terms of our overall emissions um, inventory. Okay. So that, that's, that's what the data is showing. Cool. Um, and my final question, um, so the Climate Change Response Zero Carbon Act, Amendment Act 2019 has a national target of net zero emissions by 2050. And this report says that, you know, minimal further reductions are possible without um, additional capital investment. You've already talked about that. Um, so based on the figures in this report, if we didn't do that capital investment, how long do you think it would take for PNCC to actually become carbon neutral? Uh, ever. Okay, cool, thank you. Well, um, just to comment on your previous question, uh, Councillor Dingle, uh, some of that, that type of discussion will come through in the LTP discussions and the level of service, so we can have those discussions then. All right. Thank you, councillors. Um, thank you, officers. Uh, thanks, uh, Adam, especially for your um, detailed responses. And if I could, um, uh, councillor Butt, we'll, we'll talk to you both um, at, at another time that's suitable. Right, councillors, we have the um, resolution there to receive the memo, um, and I'll look to move that, um, seconded by the Deputy Mayor. And I'd just like to make comment that um, uh, although there's been some quite technical um, questions, um, just remember four years ago, we were not even having this discussion. Uh, so we have moved at, at, I believe, some pace. And I just note through a media release here that Horizons have just entered into this space. Um, and are looking to uh, reduce their emissions by 30%, um, but in a longer time frame by 2030. So um, I want to congratulate the officers, um, especially Adam, who has been championing this report. Um, uh, the Toy 2 um, Carbon Reduction Programme, um, we've seen we've had some uh, wins, although the officers have said they are sort of perhaps the lower hanging fruit um, in a reduction of emissions um, by 20%. So. Um, we we ha we are moving well. I think if we want to do more, those discussions are firmly at the LTP uh, discussions and workshops. Um, I certainly wouldn't entertain doing something on the fly um, here and now, and I know some of you would perhaps like to do that. Um, but I think we're doing we're doing really we're doing we're on a good pathway. We've set a plan. Where, but we can revisit that at the long-term plan. And that comes with costs and levels of service discussions. So that's where those discussions should be had. So congratulations to the officers and, and uh, well done on the staff for really, I know people have done some behaviour changes. Uh, we, we're changing the way we work um, and I think for the better. So I'm fully supportive of this program and having a, and, and having a, perhaps a relook at it um, with a view to perhaps tweaking things um, at the LTP discussion. I'll open it up for any comments. Councillor Johnson. Uh, thanks, Mr Mayor. Um, I, um, I must say I found this a very uh, detailed and welcome report, uh, which I was grateful for. But I think what we have to acknowledge is that the majority of people won't read the detail in the report. They'll just be looking at the bottom lines and the overall kind of summary. And so for that reason, I think it's important that we're really clear about what's in and what's out and whether or not we're um, setting ourselves up to be compared favourably or in a more adverse way with other organisations that are talking about their own emissions. And so, you know, in respect to that, I think we do need a discussion about whether or not we opt to include things like tra uh, travel to work for staff which not all organisations include. And I don't have a strong view as to whether it's in or uh, to whether it's out, but I wouldn't like to see our uh, emissions figures compared unfavourably with someone else's when they weren't including travel to work. So I just think we need to be careful. Um, as you said yourself, these are very technical reports. Um, the detail is also 
you know, even the detail about, well, what landfills in, what landfills out, how we calculate it. A lot of these things, as um, staff explained, are done on mathematical calculations rather than actual measurements. And so we just need to be sure going forward that we are comparing ourselves uh, in exactly the same way as other organisations so that our figures don't look either unnecessarily bad or, or even unnecessarily good um, and that we have a consistent approach. And I think things like the fact that the methane calculation has changed slightly over the years, which has meant that the baseline has uh, you know, effectively changed, those things, although technical, they do affect the overall, you know, how much percent have your emissions declined by. And so we just, we just need to be across the detail in here so that the messaging that we're putting out is consistent and, and accurate and so that mm. our figures are, are trustworthy. So it's just the points I want to make. Thank you. Uh, good points, Councillor. Um, are there any more? Uh, Councillor Barrett. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor and, and colleagues, and very much do see this as, as a good news story. As a, as a council, we set the goal citywide from 2018 to 2028 to cut emissions by 25%. And so for us as an organization to be putting a 7% um, reduction in emissions on the board in year one um, of that is, is actually quite remarkable and, and would agree with the mayor well in terms of commending officers on um, the efforts um, behind that achievement. And it's certainly an achievement that I hope that most um, of the large organizations and businesses in the community take note of as well, or inspired by and, and hope to work towards as well, because obviously council needs to keep working on this as well as the community as a whole. Um, looking ahead, we do need a solid plan and I think a solid basis um, for um, making decisions as a council um, as, as has been noted by officers and in the report, we are very much at the end of the easy wins phase of this. And so bringing um, rigor, including public scrutiny to our, our forward planning on this and ensuring that we have robust options brought to us um, is going to be very, very important to continuing our momentum in this space, which is why I do have a couple additional recommendations to um, bring to your attention so that both ourselves at this table and the community more broadly has good insight and good certainty in terms of our forward planning and our trajectory into the future on this. So I'll reserve right to speak to those um, recommendations at this point. All right. Um, we'll, as we're uh, receiving the memo, we'll get that one out of the way and then we'll, um, we'll uh, go through yours, um, Councillor Barrett. Um, are there any more, any more speakers just on the um, substantive of of, of um, recommendation to receive the self. Uh, sorry, Councillor Pat. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just want to endorse Councillor Johnson's views that we have to decide that what should be in and what should be out. If it is a corporate inventory report, only the sectors related to city council or the part of the sectors related to the city council should be included. For example, if you look at any other inventory report, even the national, New Zealand national inventory report or any international report, you would not see that waste is such a dominant sector. While in our report, everything seems like coming from the waste. This is because we are considering a sector which is caused by the whole city that rubbish place, it's not the, the rubbish only that has gone from the city council. We are considering the total emission created by the whole city and claiming or portraying that this is from the city council. So we have to be um, clear that which sector and which part of the sector is ours and which we have to report, number one. I would suggest that we should ask EnviroSafe to cure us to, to, to send us clear guidance that which sectors should we consider for this inventory, this corporate inventory report. And if we are comparing ourselves with other, and we claim that we are on number 10 in, in, in terms of reducing emissions in the last so many years, so we have to 
we have to consider the other city councils, but whosoever is, is reporting their, their emissions, that what sectors they are reporting. And that is the only way that we can compare ourselves with them. Otherwise, if they are reporting um, animal emissions or agriculture emissions, and we are reporting waste emissions, they, they, they can't be compared. So we can't claim that we have reduced, and uh, I mean, um, this much of uh, emissions. Secondly, uh, we have ignored, we are ignoring, I mean, on one hand, we are taking up whole waste emissions in, in our account. And secondly, as the officer said that they have closed the, the rubbish dump and the waste is going somewhere else now, that's, that, that, that has to be considered. The, the part of the waste we are still producing is our emissions. So we have to consider that well and that one as well. So overall, it's, it, it's a good effort. It's, it's a, I mean, it's, it's a good report, but I guess we need some, what you call, some clarifications or some clear guidance from EnviroSafe, at least, that what sectors are required to be reported. Thank you. All right, no further comments. I just want to write a reply there because um, I think some councillors forget that what the report is. Um, I agree with Councillor Johnson. The comms do need to be clear here. I've gone to many forums online and actually physically around um, this subject, and uh, the public reading of this needs to be really clear. Um, even some of our councillors are confused of what is in and what is out. So, um, but actually, it is a good report. I don't want to paint this as being negative. Um, we weren't discussing this four years ago, and. Uh, we're now discussing and we're, and we're pinpricking what's in, what's out, uh, and that's good. Um, but we do have to be clear that this is a city council, um, it's on city council business or inventory, right? That's what the data is and what we're responsible for. So I, I strongly disagree with Councillor Butt uh, around the uh, Awapuni landfill. We are responsible for that landfill. That's our land. We've charged for some of that waste. So it is in, Councillor, it is in our it is in our domain and it is in this it, it needs to be in this report we can debate bonnie glenn to the cows come home but um uh, as far as what we own and where it is is ours full point so i just want to put the gloss back on this that we've done well and we shouldn't be beating ourselves up do we have more work to do definitely but actually we've started the journey and if we try and jump to the end game immediately you won't be taking the community with you so um, let's, uh, let's continue this journey, have the real stronger debates, um, more uh, topical debates at the long-term plan, um, and uh, we'll go forward from there. So now I'd like you to vote, please, on number one. Okay, that's 15-4, um, uh, one abstention. And uh, we will now, um, we will break actually, because um, we may have a little bit of debate on the next two, and um, we'll then um, come back to that. So I don't have a, there's no, I can't see the, so it's 10.45, we're back here at 11, thank you. Don't ask you to, to report on the. If you are reporting on citywide commissions, yes. then the whole yes. Otherwise, and if we want to do.